Good evening, and shalom. Blessings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to Unapologetics, the show where we are unapologetic about apologetics. And I am your host, C.J. Cox. Uh, before we get started, I want to go ahead and say a brief prayer. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to make these videos, Lord. I just want to thank you for everything you blessed us with, Lord. I want to pray that you use this video only for the glorification of your word and your kingdom, Lord, to lead people to a greater understanding, Lord, and in the end to seek you. Ask these things in Jesus Christ's name, and we give you the glory. Amen. All right. Um, so, some brief announcements. We're not really that many, just kind of the same as we've had in the last few episodes. Uh, we have our Polymathis channel that will be showing up soon. Uh, I'm not entirely sure when soon is, to be honest with you, but within the month. So, um, I guess that means mid-March is our deadline here, but Polymathis will be up within the month, and again, that'll be a Christian entertainment channel, um, and, and it is going to be, uh, mine, right? I'm going to be using it as, you know, something to review things that are, uh, more secular, I guess, technically, but from a Christian perspective, of course, um, you know, things like movies, uh, TV shows, things like that. Um, you know, doing theories and discussing and things like that. So a lot like the Watchdog in, in that sense as well, um, you know, and that we'll be talking about news and things like that. So P-O-L-U-M-A-T-H-E-S, that will be up, uh, like I said, sometime within the next month, and uh, we'll have that. That'll be pretty cool um, at any rate. <coughs> Excuse me. That's really the only announcement that we actually have um, so today we are going to be doing a correcting the record and responding to criticism for the, um, review I did of the Wolf in Sheep's Clothing documentary. Now for those of you who may or may not remember, the Wolf in Sheep's Clothing documentary is a documentary made by Theo Valentino, who is founder and operator of liesofthedevil.com. Liesofthedevil.com is a watchdog website that, uh, basically... Um, goes after people who it uh, deems to be spreading lies of the devil, right? Um, essentially, its goal is to expose those who it thinks is a threat to the body of Christ. Um, what had started that originally was a altercation that Theo actually had personally with Kent Hovind, and that ended up leading to the Wolf in Sheep's Clothing documentary. Um, I reviewed the Wolf in Sheep's Clothing documentary, I think roughly two or three months ago. Um, I have since done an interview with Dr. Ken Hovind and also talked to Theo Valentino and um, and seen a comment or two actually comments. One from, um, what is her name again? I know her name is Deborah, but she's got a YouTube channel named Deborah Sheds Light On. Um, and one from Wyatt Miklis or Miklis. So uh, with that, some context has been given to me, and there are some things that I do need to correct. I have also had uh, a few different criticisms from some people that I would like to address here today. So that is what this episode is actually going to be. Um, so let's go ahead and actually get right into that. Uh, we're going to go through first the um, claims that I need corrected. Uh, then address some of the criticisms that were brought, and then finally go through some of the things that I said in the original documentary, that I, or not in the original documentary, but in the original review, that I do still actually agree with. Now, just bear with me one moment. I need to pull up a verse that will be uh, read here in just a moment. All right. So, first claim here... And I've got them, you know, obviously written down for notes. Uh, first claim here, I did say, quote, Kent is not a minister when um, Theo Valentino said that Kent was not qualified to be a minister. I said that I thought that Kent Hoven was a teacher in the uh, positioning of the fivefold ministry and not a minister. And that I said that I didn't know if he had actually claimed to be a minister. Right. Um, and then I also said I didn't know about the verse's application in regards to I didn't know if it meant that one needed to be monogamous, which Kent technically is, or if one uh, needed to, or at least technically was, um, 
or if one needed to have never been divorced, right? And I posed the question, what about cases of legitimate divorce? What about cases where the spouse puts you away? Cases of legitimate divorce would, of course, be in the case of adultery. Uh, what about in the cases, right, like Ken's case, where the sp uh, spouse has put you away? What about cases of death, right? And so that was uh, the examples I gave to say that I don't know if the application of the verse was actually uh, accurate and also that I didn't know if Kent claimed to be a minister. Correction to the claim has to come because Kent does, in fact, claim to be a minister. Um, if you go to the documentary, not the documentary, but the episode uh, 37, my interview with Kent Hoven on this issue where we asked him some questions about um, you know, responding to this documentary, he did actually say that he is an ordained minister and that he is operating as an ordained minister. So in that sense, this verse does actually apply to him as to whether or not he is uh, eligible to be a minister, right? This is something that we would actually judge him by. I initially claimed that we that uh, we would not judge him by it because he would not be considered a minister. That is something that needed to be corrected there. Um, and with that, I think that the, the verse does actually, my, my opinions on the verse does change. Um, whilst I do still think the application on Theo's part was not correct, I think that this changes now that we have a third wife into the equation because my understanding, as I actually stated in the original review here, is that Kent is the one to be pulling the wedding ring off this time and not the other wife. Uh, in which case, that would either A, make him polygamous because he has not had an official divorce, or B, make him putting away his wife for some reason that is not adultery, which is precisely the same problem that I have with Joe putting him away, right? There is, divorce is just an evil and abominable thing, and there's absolutely no reason for it outside of the one explicit reason that our Lord and Savior gave us, which is, of course, adultery, right? And I've been very clear on that, so um, I'm not going to give Kent a pass on that if, you know, if he's living with a third wife. I don't know if that's been confirmed or not, Um but I'm, I, I do believe it has. I'm, I'm pretty sure I do remember hearing something along the lines of Mary Toko actually commenting on Facebook uh, that she had actually left uh, for reasons of threats to her own life and things like that. And so Kent does not get to pass on that, in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> and so if he's going to claim to be a minister, then yes, at this point, he would A, not either not technically meet the um, pol uh, monogamous proof there, or B, would be someone who is guilty of putting away his wife, which is not something that I think is okay. So that should be addressed and called out. <clears throat> Excuse me. So next claim here that I wanted to have corrected for the record. Um, I said that the jury is out on Kent's unwillingness to try in his marriage. Once again, uh, my interview with Dr. Hovind actually is what ended up correcting this for me. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, Kent in the interview said that the divorce was definitely going to happen and that he knew this well before uh, she got out. He claimed that she actually was not seeing him or writing him or calling him uh, nearly as frequently as she had been before for about four years before he ended up actually getting out of uh, prison and that he was fully aware that they were going to get divorced before he had ever even stepped out. He also said that it was the night that he got home that he would uh, be told he had to sleep in another bed. And he said that he tried everything, but implied that when he was trying everything that it was actually from prison and not um, while he was out of prison. Right, and again, you can go and watch my interview with Kent for yourself if you want to see that. Um, it's not the highest quality in the world, but you know, that is what he says there. So, and if that is the case, of course, then there is no jury out. And of course that is the case because that's what Kent said. Then there is no jury being out in this situation. Kent definitely was not when he got out of prison, um, trying terribly hard to keep Joe in the situation. Um, the best case scenario for Kent in this situation, if he, somebody were to be, you know, supporting him, offering a defense, would be to say that Kent was trying whilst he was in prison and that her mind had been thoroughly made up and that he recognized this and that that's why he was not trying once he got out of prison. <clears throat> if you are somebody who was a little bit more critical, 
then the claim, of course, would be that Kent is just using his own personal tragedy and past to emotionally manipulate people who are surrounding him. I invite you, the viewer, to make your own personal deductions on this issue, uh, whether or not you think that is, the, you know, A or B is the case can be up to you in that situation, but the jury's not out, is, is the point. So that is the correction that we need there. Um, I made the claim that the false teacher comment is false. And I must say this is the most disappointing correction that I think I have to make for the sole purpose that I do genuinely enjoy Kent Hovind's work on creation science. I've never particularly liked his Bible studies. I don't watch his Bible studies anymore. Um, haven't for roughly two or three years at this point. Well, no, I don't think it can be that long because I don't think they've been up for two or three years. I think he's only been out for two or three years. My time frame's real messed up. Um, but it's been a while. It, I, I, I was watching them for like the beginning of them being out. And um, maybe I think half a year of them playing. So whoever in the comment section can do the math of half a year into Kent Hovind doing his Bible studies, that would be about when I stopped watching his Bible studies. Uh, but nonetheless, um, I claimed the false teacher comment was false because I was not aware of any false or, and by false teachings, by the way, I don't mean teachings that I think are false, <clears throat> but I mean heresies. Right. I mean, something that would be damnable that, you know, the greater body of Christians could come together and saying that that's that's not what we believe. Right. Um, and it disappoints me to have to make this correction because I once again, I do really like Kent Hovind in the realm of creation science. And I do kind of think he is out of his element um, when he talks about issues that are outside of creation scientists. He is an educator, or creation science rather. He is an educator and a teacher. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm slightly disappointed to ha see him in the capacity of a minister rather than somebody who's evangelizing and debating and something like that, right? I think people should not go into realms that they're not necessarily called for. Um, I myself don't preach, right? If I, if I am called to preach at some point, then that would be great. Uh, but at the moment, I, I don't feel that I am, right? So it's just a perfect example there. Um, so with that, though, what the false teaching I have found is, is Kent has actually claimed that people who take the mark of the beast can still be saved. And um, I know that sounds mind-blowing, so I'm actually going to show you it. Instead of you just taking my word for it, we're going to show you exactly what Kent Hovind said on the issue because... Uh, quite frankly, it's not just, you know, like I said, it's not something that I think you should take my word for. I think you should fact check all of these things. I think you should fact check everything that Kent says and everything that Theo says. And I think you should fact check everything that I say as well. Um, I think I said that to start this. That was a little redundant. Point being that, you know, you should never take anybody's words for it. You should always um, fact check for yourself, right? Uh, be skeptical, not overly skeptical to the point of not believing anything, but healthily skeptical uh but nonetheless here listen to this <clears throat> and still go to heaven because i'm sealed unto the day of redemption but now now we have a contradiction because god says anybody who takes the mark of the beast is absolutely going to hell with no chance to get out. So that's that's but, a really, it, is, it does not it, it does not say anything of the kind. Listen to it carefully. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, there are three things you have to do. Worship the beast and or his image and receive his mark. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. So, so if a Christian does all those three things, will they, will they still be saved? I don't know. I think so. 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 And, of course, you know, it, it just keeps doing that on repeat, uh, this video, because it's uh, saying that it's wanting to call out Kent, of course. Um, that is definitely not true okay that's that's just incorrect the idea that you can take the mark of the beast and still be saved is 
not only plainly false, but it, it, it's almost, you know, it's one of those statements that's such an oxymoronic statement that it, it kind of hurts the brain. You know what I mean? It's like saying that there's a black-white. You know what I mean? The, the point of the Mark of the Beast is that you are sealed unto damnation. That is the entire purpose of it, and that you have to take it, of course, in order to buy or sell. It is a mark of loyalty unto the Beast. Um, however, you know, the, the point is, is it's, it's this final dividing between Christians and non-Christians, right? And to say that you can... T and actually, you know, I love the Left Behind books. I absolutely love the Left Behind books. There is some problems with the Left Behind books, and one of them was one of the characters in the Left Behind books, I, I this really annoyed me, um, actually was forcefully implanted with this Mark of the Beast, which they had as being a microchip. <clears throat> and um, he was still saved because he didn't willingly take it, which was, I, I don't know, it was an interesting concept if you wanted to think about it philosophically, but if you wanted to think about it biblically, it was just not nonsense, right? It was hogwash. Um, excuse me, um, and, and I think that is kind of the same problem you're having here with Ken. It's it, that's just nonsense, and it's it's dangerous, dangerous, dangerous nonsense. I'd just like to point out because those who do take the mark of the beast will definitely be damned. They will be amongst those who say, "Did I not do such and such a thing?" And God says, "I never knew you." Right? Um, which, of course, is a paraphrasing. It's not a direct quote, but anyways, um, I did not find any other false teachings besides that. I know that there are claims um, that Theo makes about uh, him being okay, Kent being okay with things like bestiality and things like that. Um, I have heard the the videos where he says that Kent is claiming bestiality is okay. No, no. Um, I, I don't think that that is what they're saying, is, is my conclusion. I think that Kent is just straightforward reading the verse, right, saying exactly what it is that it says, which is precisely um what theo is criticizing but theo is taking it so ba basically here's the criticism right it says that um ken oven believes that when he was named that when adam was naming all of the animals uh that he would have had the ability to have sex with them if he wanted to um to a certain extent i guess this would depend on your definition on free speech or not free speech sorry free will versus predestination um, however, if you do take the free will perspective, but also are not somebody who is an open theist, then basically this would work out like this. Yes, technically that is true. However, God was fully aware in his infinite and all-knowing wisdom that there was absolutely no chance that would happen because he didn't make Adam for horses. And that the process of this would to be A, establish the fact that um, all of the different animals are, in a sense, help me to... Uh, to human beings, right? Not in the romantic sense that the woman is, of course, but in a sense, you know, the, the, you just saw my cat here, that we have companions, right? Or in other cases, we have workers or guards and things like that. Um, and obviously, B, to get the animals named. And I think that is what Kent is saying here. I don't think he's actually saying that Adam was going to have sex with the animals. I think that's ridiculous. Um, but there is definitely this claim here about taking the mark of the beast and still being able to be saved, and I cannot stress enough how dangerous I think that is, and how I think Kent should definitely repent of that. That is like, that is a horrid teaching. That is a terrible heresy, um, and it needs to go away. And also, by the way, this isn't something that has come to light, you know, to come to my attention um, now, as in like I didn't know. It's not something that I didn't know at the time of doing the original review. It's just something I have thought about further. Um, and this is King James onlyism. Um, now, my preferred Bible is the King James. I love the King James. I think that it is very. First off, I find it to be a very accurate translation, um, and second off, I like the poetic nature of it. I think that it brings a certain level of regality to the Bible that um, that I just love to read. That I love to hear. Um, when people say that it's difficult to read, I kind of enjoy that personally because I think that it kind of, it almost sets apart the Bible from other books. And that is, of course, all my personal opinion. However, the claim that the King James Version is the infallible doctrine, the infallible word of God, right? It, it is, I mean, and infallible apart from every other translation, right? Including some going as far as to say infallible 
um, apart from every other translation in every other language. I've even heard Kent go as far as to say you can correct the Hebrew and Greek with the English translation, something that James White has pointed out numerous times, that is just patently false. And that is another very dangerous belief, I think. I wouldn't go as far as to say that it is a heresy. I would go as far as to say the leaders in the King James only movement are people who border on heretical and definitely false teachers um, because the the basic fact of the matter is and it, you know first off you do have the track record right Peter Ruckman Gail Rippling or Stephen Anderson it's not like um, it's not like King James onlyism has good fruit in this particular regard and I mean no disrespect to any of those people but I mean come on right come on what did you know Stephen Anderson is somebody who has actively celebrated uh, people being murdered uh, simply because he's you know thought that that's something that he thinks the Bible has commanded him. And of course, homosexuality is a sin. I'm not saying that those people were not sinful. Of course, they were deserving of God's wrath and all that uh, you know, whole shebang. Um, you could look at any of my previous videos on the law to you know see what I think about the law. I'm not in any way justifying uh, what you know what the people inside of that nightclub were doing. However. What I am definitely saying is celebrating their death is disgusting and unchristian. Um, Gail Ripplinger saying God and Ripplinger is ridiculous, right? And the Ruckmanites are practically a cult, um, and, and etc. But on top of having the you know these cultic fruits, the King James only movement also is something that that can be incredibly dangerous. What if it is? that somebody finds that the English version of the King James Bible has something in it that is just patently incorrect. I have nothing of that nature has been uh, you know, given to my attention, but I am a lay scholar at best. A lay person is probably the better, ac you know, more accurate description. Um, and I'm also only 20 years old. So there is definitely some information that I'm lacking here. Just because I don't know of it doesn't mean it's not there and maybe it's not there. But the simple fact of the matter is taking an English translation that was written almost 1,500 years, maybe even over 1,500 years, I think, um, after the very last book of the scripture was written as more uh, infallible than things that have come thousands of years before it, I think is ridiculous. Now, there are arguments for the King James Onlyist that I sympathize with, and this is definitely a topic for another video. We could go an entire hour on this for sure. Um, but the conclusion that the King James Version is the only infallible word of God, I think, is ridiculous. And I think the leaders of the group are, while I wouldn't necessarily go as far as to say it's heresy, I think it is bordering on heresy because of its uh, cultic-like reverence for a particular translation. I almost think it borders on idolatry. And I think that they are definitely false teachers in that regard. Um, that is my opinion. They obviously disagree with that opinion. And that's okay. I guess not not really but um i mean it's okay they disagree with me right we have those rights but i just mean obviously i do i do have a problem with king james only i don't want to discount what i just said uh claim number four that i need to correct here that glenn stoll was the guilty party and that kent was just following his legal advice um correction i do think kent was fully aware of what he was doing um and therefore did deserve some of the blame. And actually, if you go back and watch the original review, you will see I slightly contradict myself in it, in that I do come to the conclusion that Kent Hovind definitely committed a crime, namely withholding uh, taxes, um, you know, right, to income tax evasion, basically. <clears throat> However, I also say that I think that he was just following bad legal advice on the part of Glenn Stoll. Um, that, I think, is my own personal biases creeping in, and I think that that needs to be noted and corrected for the record, right? It is much, much, much more likely than not that if Kent was uh, guilty of tax evasion, that he was fully aware of it. Um, the fact that there is, you know, time clocks and uh, talks of vacation hours, right, and, you know... Um, saying that you know certain unpaid hours will be going out to these vacation hours right and all, all this other kind of stuff um i think that clearly indicates that this is a business 
in, in some way that this is not necessarily just a ministry, but that this is not, you know, but that this is rather something that is going to generate a profit and operate as a company. And I think you actually see evidence for that in some of the more minor infractions that Kent did commit that the documentary shows, like uh, lying about being a sovereign citizen or like the fact that he said uh, he was not going to get permits, right? Because he didn't have to, because um, they were only subject to God's law, which of course contradicts, uh, is it Romans 13? I believe it is Romans 13. I wanted to say Romans 9, but I'm pretty sure it's Romans 13. Yeah, it is Romans 13, sorry. Um, but at any rate, so I did want to correct that. And therefore, that does mean that I, I do think Ken Hoven did deserve at least some of his prison sentence. Um, at least if we are going by the United States legal code. I would like to point out that I firmly disagree with the income tax as well as the structuring law, which is a crime I don't think that Kent committed. Um, but the legal route to go about that is to repeal the income tax. It is not to not pay the income tax. So um, there's, there's the correction there. Claim number five, I would like corrected. There is no documentation of Wyatt asking Kent to repent. The reason I made this claim was because I um, was making, I was basically saying that if you are claiming that Wyatt wants Kent to repent, then you are claiming that Wyatt thinks that Kent has something to repent of. Of course, making it seem as if that is somebody who has come into contact with Kent who now thinks that he is an unchristian man. And since there was no evidence of that, I was saying that there was no evidence of Wyatt um, basically coming to the conclusion that Kent was an unchristian man. Um, Wyatt commented on the review saying that this was in fact the case, that that is what his, uh, he said to Ernie. So that does need to be corrected here. Um, Wyatt Nicholas is somebody who did uh, say he wanted to, that Kent was, uh, you know, um, what is the word there? Engaging, sorry, in unchristian behavior and that he needed to repent of it. So that needed to be corrected there as well. Claim number six, that there was no documentation of Ernie Land divul divulging sensitive information. Um, now, in a sense, this isn't, you know, it, it's not, I don't know. So first of all, let me just say the, the videos do exist. Okay, I've heard them personally. They definitely exist. Ernie Land is definitely divulging not sensitive information, but... Um, information that is <laughs> illegal to say the least um basically the long and short of it because i i you know i'm not really too worried about anybody coming after me i ain't got much to lose and this is everything i have to my knowledge uh ernie is saying in these recordings that um he believes that he does not know but that he believes it is possible, and he uses a lot of language to try and distance himself from it, to try and be all nice and politically correct and, I guess, legal with it. Um, but that he believes it is possible that Kent is committing the exact same crime that got him put in prison in the first place. And, of course, if that is the case, that would be incredibly unfortunate. And it is entirely possible that it could be the case, considering that it is Ernie who said that. Now, Kent Hoven, if you are watching this interview, and that is not true, or not this interview, this... Uh, uh, correction here and that is not true you need to talk to ernie land because i have heard that recording and it definitely does exist that is a fact okay now the reason i was saying it's weird is because i don't think it is my fault that i did had to make this correction in the sense uh, that um this information is not in the documentary and theo if you are watching this I think that at this point you have released enough information to where it doesn't matter. I understand why you did not want to release this information. However, the cat is out of the bag. You've told people that they can call you. You've told people this information exists. You might as well show it. Okay. Um, there's no reason to keep it, uh, keep it out of the public sphere at this point in time. That is obviously my opinion and you can do whatever it is that the Lord leads you to do. However, um, those recordings do definitely exist. And um, I personally think that they should be out. I think that those are that is something that should not be withheld from the public in this regard. Um, also, on that note, I would like to say um, th that is that is an incredibly disappointing thing to hear 
that is actually one of those things to where it's, you know, when you hear something like that, when you hear that Kent might be doing the exact same thing that actually got him in trouble in the first place. Um, and, of course, it's all mites and maybes and possiblies, but it's from Ernie Land's own mouth for crying out loud. Um, and it's just, it, it sucks to hear. It, it's one of those things where it's like, dude, you are one of, or at least were, I'm not entirely sure what some of the debates are, um, have been recently. I just haven't watched them. Um, I'm sure that they're still great, right? I'm sure that you're still one of the sharpest young Earth creation scientists out there at the, this moment in time. But there is no way that people continue to follow you if you lack legitimacy. And actually, there are some other things that have caused me to come to conclusions like this since uh, that I have made this original review. For example, I have since watched James White's uh, videos where he was feuding with Dr. Hovind. And Dr. Hovind's responses to James White are utterly ridiculous. They're nonsense. And of course, they're not situations that are barring legal jail time. Um, or, you know, moral, morally questionable actions. Um, but there are situations that are calling into question the legitimacy and honesty of the person we're talking to. And I really, really, really do not want to call into question the legitimacy and honesty of this person because I greatly admire this person. However, Dr. Hovind, if you are committing crimes, you need to knock it off. That is against the biblical code. It is against what the Bible says we need to do. Read Romans 13. Um, read actually where Jesus says specifically, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, okay? And don't lie about it. And there are lies that you were caught in, in the lies of the devil document, or in the wolf in sheep's clothing documentary. I actually noted them in my original review, um, such as the lie about being a sovereign citizen. The documentation is actually given in the documentary. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> that's, that, that is that though. I mean, not much more can be said about that in that situation. So, uh, claim number seven, Ernie's words to Josh weren't direct threats. Um, I personally wanted to correct the record on this and say that I think that Joshua Jocelyn actually probably was, uh, probably was um, justified in saying that these were violent threats against him. Uh, having, you know, heard them again and heard them again and heard them again. I mean, I think I just, I just think I was wrong initially you know nobody has come to me and said hey you need to correct this this is just one of those ones that i just i think i was initially wrong i kind of defended early in saying that i thought he was just somebody who talked boisterously um you know i come from an area where that is very common for people to talk in a way that is just you know flamboyant it's boisterous it's loud it's you know sounds intimidating uh, but it's not truly aggressive in the sense of that it's somebody wanting to attack you and so i kind of used that as a way to, you know, justify, oh, I could see how Ernie was saying the things he was saying and not necessarily being violent. But um, having thought about it, I just don't think that's true. I think that's nonsense. I think it is pretty clear that Ernie seems to be threatening Josh. And I stand by what I said in the original review. Joshua Johnson's article is not a hit piece. It is very fair in its writing. Anybody who thinks that that writing there is unfair, I'm sorry, but you just, you need to revamp what your definition of fair is, okay? You may not like the criticisms in it, criticisms in it, and you may even think they're incorrect, but it's definitely not something that is, like, out to get Kent Hovind, okay? Um, <clears throat> claim number eight, that there was no documentation of the abducted kid. Uh, need to issue a correction there because Rhonda Audrey, the secretary, has actually admitted that this has happened. Um, Kent Hovind has actually downplayed the situation, and you can actually see him do that on my uh, interview with him on Odd Apologetics episode 37, if you guys are interested in that. And those are all the corrections I wanted to make. Um, just to keep the record, obviously, uh, you know, in line with what is truth. Uh, everything needs to be done properly in this situation. It is a documentary. It's not a fictional story. So we want to make sure we're getting all of our facts correct. So these corrections just had to be issued. I um, want to address a few brief criticisms that I've gotten uh, from a few different people. Uh, first things first, there have been criticisms from actually more than one person that this was too harsh, I guess, on Theo, too much of a defense of Kent. I've gotten this actually from people close to me. I've gotten this from people who are, you know, not so close to me, but are people who are important to the situation. Um... 
I am sorry you feel that way, but that is not true. I actually, so I made a list here of claims that I back, and we're going to go through them uh, more later. However, almost half of them are claims that are critical of Kent Hovind. Um, to say that I was in any way, shape, or form defending Kent and railing against Theo in the original review is, is just not backed up by the facts of what I actually said. Um, if you go back and watch the original review, you will see that I criticized Kent for the possibility of having a third wife. I criticized Kent for having violent rhetoric when he said that, you know, don't criticize my bride-to-be to my face. I criticized Kent for marrying somebody again so quickly. I criticized Kent for not owning up to the fact that his wife did have some immodest photos out. I criticized Kent for committing an income tax crime. I, um... Well, there's other ones in here. We'll go through them later. But the fact of the matter is there were tons of... Anthony Jaworski, right, is another one I'd criticize. I'd called Kent downright repugnant in one situation. You'd go back and read. The language I used was very strong. I said it was a disgusting situation when he said that the person who um, Brady Byram was helping pro bono when their, children, when their child went missing, when he said that, you know, that that's not something that you should be able to do off of my dollar. I was very very displeased with that and I made it perfectly clear so I'm sorry if you feel that my original review was railing against Theo or was defending Kent Hovind it certainly was not okay and I challenge anybody to actually show me where I was being unfair in the original review I might have gotten some things wrong okay but that is not the same thing as being unfair being dishonest or being defensive in one person's case or the other in fact the whole reason I pointed out in the original review that I was a Kent Hovind fan and not a Theo Valentino fan was to try and let you guys know what my um, what my biases going into this review already were and that I was going to be trying to downplay them, right? This is not a case where I was trying to sneak up on you guys with some sort of sneaky defense of Kent Hovind. That is not the case here. Um, another criticism I got that this was uh, taking a while. Uh, basically, the long and short of that is the people who this documentary affected told me that this wasn't something I needed to make a priority. So I didn't make it a priority. Um, that doesn't mean I wasn't going to do it. I obviously told you guys I was going to do it, so I was going to do it, and here I am doing it. Um, I was not going to do it this fast. I will admit that there are people who are um, close to this who have said that I should make it a priority now, so I am making it a priority now. Um but the video was definitely going to be made. The corrections were going to be made here. Um, I just, I didn't feel that it was a priority because again, the people who are close to this told me it wasn't a priority. And furthermore, I have already been perfectly clear in stating, you know, Eric Hovind, Joshua Joslin, Ernie Land, Rudy Davis, Theo Valentino, any of you guys, if you want to come on to this show, tell me where I biffed personally. Uh, tell me what your side of the story is, right? Um, any of the different you know, et cetera, that fill in the blank there, you are certainly able to do so. I'm perfectly willing to have a conversation with uh, with any of you, right? Um, I'm not coming at this to attack anyone or defend anyone, like I already said. So, <clears throat> you know, to a certain extent, if people really feel that strongly that um, their side of the story needs to come out or that some corrections need to be made or something along those lines, then talk to me. By all means, come tell your side of the story. Perfectly willing to have that happen. Um, other criticisms. What was there? Other criticisms on there. Uh, there was criticisms on the video quality. Unfortunately, I just couldn't do much about that at the time. So I do apologize for that. Um, I understand the video quality. And actually, the video quality in the... In the uh, in the what is, what was that interview right is is way worse um because i'm first off i'm outside and second off it is night so it's dark outside and third off i am actually talking to ken hoven on my cell phone um and, and the video quality is just atrocious in that video but um you know now of course i do have higher quality i got you know the microphone and camcorder and all that kind of stuff got the intro so uh, we're, we're improving on that, and, and I apologize for having such atrocious quality in the past, but hopefully we can get past that and actually look to the content of the videos there. Um, one last correction I would actually like to point out. 
I did actually initially give the documentary a uh, C minus or D rating for reasons that I'm actually going to go into with the claims that I back up. Um, I would I would actually say more like a C or a C plus. Uh, all things considered, especially considering some of the information that I now know. And I would also like to point out um, that I have no personal uh, vendettas one way or the other in this situation anymore. I'm kind of, excuse me, I'm, I'm kind of over wanting to, um, well, I, I, I don't know. I guess basically the way the way I'm trying to put it is that I, I've kind of, I, you know, I've talked to both sides of the uh, equation here. I know both sides of the story and, um, you know, I mean, that's all, that's all I can do in the situation. I'm an outsider looking in, you know, that's, that's the end of that. There's just, there's nothing more that I can really say after this video. Um, nonetheless, I do want to go through some things that I do stick by because I don't want you guys to get this impression that I just disregard everything I said in the previous video. There was a lot of things I said in the previous video that I do definitely still back up. So let's go through those right now. Uh, Theo made a comment that Kent was playing on people's emotions and that he was being an effeminate when he cried in one of his episodes. I think that those comments were unfounded and wrong. I think that they were hypocritical given the fact that the documentary definitely does play on your emotions, things that Theo, if he is honest, would, tr would surely admit. Um, and by the way, I have no reason to believe that Theo is dishonest, so that is not a jaded comment. I am just simply saying um, when, you know, he plays certain, you know, intense emotional music when Kent Hovind is talking about money in order to imply that he's a criminal, right? That is definitely playing on people's emotions when he has the piano playing when he starts saying this is why i'm making the video right or creepy music when he's having um kent hoven read a adolf hitler quote right that is playing on people's emotions it is manipulating people's emotions so that is the first problem it's intensely hypocritical the second problem of it being intensely hypocritical is that he's saying that kent hoven is being an effeminate for crying and yet he also says in the documentary that he wept over this situation now as i said in the original review I don't actually blame anyone for crying in this situation. I think in both of their situations, it was appropriate to cry. Um, that being said, Theo is the one who made the claim that Kent was being an effeminate. And then third, it is perfectly rational and reasonable to see why Kent Hovind would cry one time in one video in this particular situation. Did he work himself up to cry? If you want to be skeptical and critical, I guess you can make that claim. I think it's bogus. Okay, that's just, that's all I'm saying there. Um... Thing number two that I back, Joe Hoven's divorce was justified, or was not justified, rather. Um, I, that's just, I mean, there's not much else to really say on that. I don't think she was justified in divorcing Kent. I think that the Bible is very clear on what the legal reasons for, or what the justifiable, rather, reasons for divorce are. And Kent was not committing any of them. So, um, now... There has been some hearsay claims that Kent was actually committing adultery with Mary Toko before he even went to jail. Um, those claims are unfounded. So, uh, I mean, that's all you can say is some people have claimed such things, right? Um, the propaganda claims are, I mean, hypocritical to say the least. Um, Kent Hoven is not putting out propaganda any more so than Theo Valentino is in the sense because what he was talking about was the anti-government stuff. Um, Kent has every right to be anti-government. And in the sense that, you know, if what Kent is putting out about the government is propaganda, since it is against the government, I assume that means if something is against something, then it must be propaganda. Well, you were putting out a documentary against Kent Hoven, therefore that must be propaganda. Um, I, I, that is the logical conclusion, I think, if I'm using your logic there, and I, and I don't think either situation classifies as propaganda, but once again, I'm not the one making the claim. Um, point number four that I still back. Kent's don't criticize my wife comments were out of line, and Kent shouldn't have remarried, and if he has a third wife, that that is incredibly troublesome, and in fact, even probably adulterous I it, you know I obviously don't know the details so it's possible that it wasn't but uh, 
what little details we do have seem to indicate that it certainly is adulterous. Um, that is something I obviously said in the first review, and that is something I back now, and that is something that I'm not going to back away from. I have a very, 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 very strict view of marriage, and I'm sorry if you don't. The Bible does, and you need to conform yourself to what the Bible says if you agree with what the Bible on the scenario, okay? That's all I'm saying, or on the situation, rather. Uh, point number five, that the false leader, cult leader, false prophet, and cult leader comments are hearsay at best. Um... The claims that uh, Kent has said that he is told by God to do this, to do what he's doing, right? Uh, well, Theo has also claimed in the documentary that he was told by God to make the documentary. So if Theo was told by God to make the documentary and Kent was told by God to do his ministry and being told by God something that you were not told by God makes you a false prophet, then I think Theo needs to prove to us that he was told by God to make the documentary or uh, be called a false prophet. Or, of course, he could just recognize the fact that this is something that people say when they mean that they were pulled by the Holy Spirit to do such and such a thing, right? Not that they were actually directly told by revelation from God. The cult leader claim I still find to be ridiculous, okay? Um, there are no um, secretive teachings or hierarchies from Dinosaur Adventure Land that anybody's shown. There are hearsays for sure, okay, but there has not been any Masonism coming from the Kent Hovind DAL, um, not, you know, Dinosaur Adventure Land theme park. There has not been any uh, secretive teachings or doomsday prophecies. Uh, there has not been, you know, radical teachings. Um, you know, you might say, you know, what about that whole thing about the Mark of the Beast? Well, if Kent Hovind is having that you know, be taught to everybody who is at DAL, then I guess that would be one thing, but there's no evidence that he's starting a denomination that passes on all of his particular views. Um, he may be having a lot of these Bible studies, of course, but these Bible studies are with people who come in and out. Uh, some of them obviously stay for long periods of time, but even then it's a few months at Benz. I don't think anything, anybody actually permanently lives there except for Kent and, um, you know, his wife at the moment. Um, so, the, you know, the cult leader claims are just, they're just false, right? From everything that we can gather right now, they are false. If they turn out to be true in the future, if there's a situation where a David Koreshi kind of thing happens, then I will recant everything and take back what I said. However, uh, as it stands right now, I see these claims as hearsay at best. Um, so, point number six here that I would um, stand by. Kent definitely did want the Mark Hill video out. Uh, Kent definitely, at the time that he was having the conversation with Mark Hill, wanted the Mark Hill video out. Um, and, and that's just all you can say about that. Uh, point number seven that I still back. Eric should not have uh, charged his father rent, nor should he have kept the ministry. Basically, here is the way I see this. It is either Kent Hovind's or the government's. Okay. Either it was all accumulated illegitimately, in which case the government needs to take it. It is a debt that is owed, okay? Or it was accumulated legally and morally and ethically, in which case it belongs to Kent Hovind. In neither of those situations does it belong to Eric Hovind. Now, I admire Eric Hovind's financial savvy in saving it all, right, by getting it over to GodQuest. Um in doing so by spending a very small amount of money, right? Getting its $3,000 worth of asset that he managed to save for, by only spending 6000 I mean, that's a pretty good investment, all things considered. Um, the fact of the matter is he used it to become a foundation stone for his own ministry, and I don't think he should have done that. Um, I think that <clears throat> maybe there was a tendency for a lot of us, including myself, to criticize a little bit more than we had any business doing with some of, with some of the lack of information that we had. Um, I think Kent, or Eric rather, is um, certainly more understandable than a lot of people gave us, a lot of people gave him rather credit for him, including myself uh, in this situation. However, with that being said, I do still think he's in the wrong, and I think that that belongs either to Kent or to um, the government. Uh, point number eight, Rudy Davis definitely did lie to, uh, lie about not talking to Theo and Eric, um, before 
Kent got out of jail. That is documented plainly by the documentary, and that is one of the claims from the original review that I back. Point number nine that I still back from the original review, Kent does seem more interested in I built CSE concept than the it's God's money concept, and that is something I had a significant problem with. Point number ten that I agreed with um, from my original review is that Kent Hovind definitely lied about the sovereign citizen movement. By the way, notice how a bunch of these are criticisms of Kent Hovind. And notice how these are things I said in the original review that I'm backing now. Just for, again, for those of you who were claiming that I was uh, too soft on Kent or that I was railing Theo. I'm, I'm sorry, you're just wrong. Okay. Uh, point <clears throat> number 11 that I still do back. Kent was definitely shown to be breaking the law by not getting building permits for his expansions. Point number 12. Uh, Kent broke the income tax law. I still do not think that he broke the structuring law. Point number 13 that I still back. Kent's anti-government video should not, and I cannot stress this enough, should not have been taken. Should Kent have lied about what video it was? Absolutely not. That is ridiculous. Kent's claim at the moment is, I believe if I remember from the, because I asked him this on the interview with him, um, I'm, I'll go back and issue a correction in the comment section below, or one of you guys, if you get to it before I can, can do so as well. But I believe what he said in the, um, in the interview with him is that they took both. Um, now, that is not the impression that I was under, so I still find that to be slightly dishonest. However, with that being said, they should not have taken any videos. The fact of the matter is, Kent Hovind has free speech. He can say whatever he wants. He can advocate the fact that he doesn't like the income tax, that it needs to be abolished, that we shouldn't have to pay it, that people shouldn't pay it. In fact, if you go to what the Supreme Court has to say about this, everything except for act directly advocating a crime to happen right, in, right now in your general vicinity, right, uh, everything besides that is a crime. Everything besides what they would call a call to action, right? Basically saying, so if I were to say uh, so even something egregious, right? Like, um, which just is a good example. Uh, I don't know, because they probably wouldn't care for, for the example, say Trey Parker and Matt Stone are rapists. Say I said that, okay? Um, I actually have a right to say that, Um Although that could also be construed as libel, I guess. Um, I guess if I if I did knowingly, uh, like if I knew for a fact they weren't, and I said that, that would definitely be libel. Um, however, if I said, "Hey, string up Trey Parker and Matt Stone because they're rapists," that's a call to action. I don't have any evidence for that, and in that situation, I have violated free speech. So, considering how lenient our free speech laws are supposed to be. Kent Hovind had every right to make whatever video he pleases, and it should not have been confiscated under any circumstances. Um, and, I, and I don't think anybody should care about them being anti-government. Point number 14, Kent's attack on Brady um, for the pro bono case was just evil. It was just evil. Um, sorry, there's no other way to put it. Um, that was an entirely unchristian response to a poor family in a poor situation where their child is missing, right? And Brady Byron, being a sweet person, said, I will take the case pro bono, um, and Kent seemed to let his own personal greed get in the way. Should Brady have talked to Kent about it beforehand? Yeah, sure, probably, if Kent's going to fill, fit the bill. That would probably be a good conversation to have. However, saying, oh, sell your house, sell your car, sell your shoes, um, when it's a situation of their kid missing is just unchristian. And that's just the only way to put it. It's evil. It needs to be repented of. End of the conversation. Uh, point 15 that I still back. Theo should have released the secret recordings, um, and the recordings should not have been secret. I understand it is legal. I don't personally like it. That's fine if you disagree. Um, as far as the videos being out, I already said earlier in this particular video that I think that those videos need to be out. They, we're already aware they exist, so there's no reason for them to not be out. Uh, point number 16 from the original review that I still back, Kent definitely blackmailed Josh Joslin, and that was not okay. That is something that needs to be repented of on Kent Hovind's part. Joshua Joslin does not appear to be somebody who was in any way, shape, or form trying to make enemies with Kent Hovind, um, and yet he ended up getting pretty terribly slandered, actually, in ways that have actually caused me to um, to question quite a bit of, you know, why, why Kent Hovind 
would feel the need to go down to this level. Um, I, I certainly hope that that is something that will be repented of in the future. Point number 19, or not, ugh, sorry, 17, that I still agree with from the original review. Anthony Jaworski case was wrong, and Kent's claims of mental illness that were made in Unapologetics 37 interview do not justify it. Number 18, Kent's claims of adultery and Theo's claims of adultery are hearsay. Okay, they are both hearsay. Kent saying that Theo committed adultery and was promiscuous is hearsay. Theo saying that Kent committed adultery and, permi and is promiscuous is hearsay. There's no evidence to back either situation. If you choose to believe one of them, that is your prerogative. Okay, um, If you choose to not believe one of them, it is your prerogative. If you choose to not get involved in it and just leave it up to other people as I have done, that is your prerogative. However, it is both hearsay in that situation. You know, It's really whoever you want to believe, I guess. Whoever you feel like you have the most evidence to believe. Point number 19 that I do still back from the original review. Theo did not want the workload placed on him, and this is quite well documented in the documentary. Uh, he was, in, in a very real sense, pressured into taking a lot of Mary Toko's work. Point number 20. Um, the comparisons to Adolf Hitler, even if they are sort of, you know, um, not so, like so direct, like, oh, this person is Adolf Hitler... Uh, and the, you know the claims of compound and things like that. They're just they're all hearsay, and there is no real evidence behind them other than you and some other people who have claimed such a thing. Um, point number twenty one that I still do back the pedophile case is really really weird and not cool in any way, shape, or form. Um, the official story is just disgusting and quite frankly I'm not in any way shape or form happy about the fact that this is somebody Kent Hovind associates with um, if there is information I am missing by all means uh, Dr. Hovind you are fully able you know fully um, you know basically you have the right to you know call me at any point in time if you'd like I, I'm definitely willing to hear your side of the story but according to all the information I have now I can tell you right now that that is the situation I definitely do not like at all uh, point number 22, I still back up. Theo's claims that, uh, you know, claims of you, uh, Kent mixing up narcissist versus control freak and his claims about monastery when he said everything's going to the monastery uh, and kind of, you know, it was like mixing the words monastery and ministry. Those are nitpicking. They are not actual instigations of Kent and what he's trying to do. The claim that Kent is some sort of Jesuit monk or something like that, I think is just completely ridiculous. And has been made by others before, like Bryant Denlinger. Um, I, I just don't think it, it is true. Final one here. Um, documentary does have very many good points, does have very many things that definitely needed to come out, that we all needed to know. Uh, but there are very many wrong points. There are very many points where it goes too far. When it's going in claiming that Kent is a cult leader and not showing any documentation or evidence that Kent is a cult leader, I, I think that that is an example of going too far. When it gets nitpicky saying that, you know, the word monastery or, um, you know, the getting the words narcissist and term control freak mixed up or Freudian slips or things like that. I, I think that that's just completely ridiculous. Or when it says hypocritical things like you are um, you're preying on people's emotions while also manipulating people's emotions. And, you know, I, I, I don't like that. At the same time, there are things in this documentary that definitely needed to come out. For example, the fact that Ernie Land has some, you know, like I said, some, some interesting things to say about what's going on. And I really wish the uh, video evidence was actually shown in the documentary. And also, Kent Hoven seems to be dishonest about his previous crimes. And also, we don't necessarily have the full story, though I wouldn't necessarily say that I am on Team Eric. I mean, you guys know my opinions on the whole Eric Hoven situation. It is still not the situation we originally thought it was, right? And so, the documentary has a lot of good points. It also has a lot of really bad ones. Um, I, and like I said, I give it a rating of about a C. Um, better than the C minus slash D that I was originally going, but to give it about a C. So, yeah, that's everything I got here. Um, let's just go ahead and say a brief prayer before we end this. Hi, Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for allowing me to make this video. Um, I pray that you've helped me to neither stray, to the, stray towards the right or the left, Lord Jesus. And I pray that 
you do nothing more but glorify you and your word and your kingdom through this video and through anything else that I make, Lord. We dedicate it all to you and give you the glory. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if you guys like this video, please do like and share, of course, and subscribe here to the synagogue if you are interested in our content and think we deserve it. Uh, comment any questions, comments, concerns, criticisms, or anything of that nature in the comment section below. We are certainly open to any discussions and criticisms and etc. And if you are interested, you can go to Terrestrial Earthbird, parentheses, The Synagogue on Twitter, ACP Official on Gab, Cynic Thought on Instagram, or the American Cynic Party on Facebook, where you can uh, follow us or like our pages on any of those uh, platforms. Thank you guys very much for watching. And shalom.